This is Simone. And this is Katinka. And you are listening to the Novatech podcast. We live in a time when technology is changing faster than ever before and transforming the way we live and interact with the world. The question is, how do we keep up? In this podcast, we'll interview real people and certainly hear their tips on how to learn, adapt, and succeed in this ever-changing world of technology. Are you ready? Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, our guest is Alex Barretto. Alex has been in the product development industry for over 20 years, with the last 14 years running Agile engineering teams. He joined a cloud guru as VP of engineering in January 2020, and has previously worked for MyOB, Census, Primus Telecom, Sydney University, and the United Nations Development Program in similar leadership roles. Alex is passionate about Agile and has a distinctive motivation for leading and developing people. So, welcome, Alex. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's a pleasure to, to join you today. You are working at one of the most well-known global online training platforms right now. What do you do in your current role and how you ended up there? Let us know. And what did you do in your tech journey to look like what is today? Sure. Well, I started at a cloud guru in January 2020. And over there, I look after the engineering department. So our team has pretty much doubled in size since we acquired Linux Academy. And we are just about 100, over 100 people now in, in, in the engineering group. In the engineering group, I do have my teams split across Australia and the US. Here in Australia, I've got about seven engineering teams. In the US, we've got about six, seven engineering teams, plus data engineering, security, DevOps. Yeah, so that's that's the group. How I end up at, at a cloud guru. So I left my job in 2019. I was working there for about six years. I really wanted to join a smaller organization that had a great mission, great culture, and, and, and great people. And as you know, there aren't many places in Melbourne that could tick all these boxes. So I was referred to ACG by a mentor of mine and went through the process in November. And by December, I had an offer to start with the company in January. So... ACG being a startup had ambitions, plans to grow, and given my experience helping organizations scale up, I think this was the perfect opportunity for me to to join the company. So interesting enough, um, just before I signed the contract with ACG, they acquired Linux Academy, so which made the opportunity even more exciting and challenging. And my first day in the company was actually in Texas when all the engineering leaders came together to discuss how we would integrate the two organizations. So that was perfect timing. And as for my tech journey, I didn't have the privilege to have access to computers until I actually joined a computer science uni degree in 1992. So I wasn't sure whether that was the right path for me. I was really good with science and maths and the IT industry was very promising back in Brazil. So I really enjoyed the subjects and it didn't take long for me to get into it and be happy with my decision. So that was like the start of my journey. And then, you know, worked for Unibanco, which is a big bank in Brazil, um, worked for a couple of other small organizations until I ended up at the United Nations Development Program. I was a, I had a dev manager role over there. And that was the last professional experience I had in Brazil before I came to Australia. In 2002, I decided to move to Australia. So I came over here to do a master's degree in software engineering at Macquarie University in Sydney. So lived there for three and a half years, working for the Macquarie University in the projects department, then moved to the Sydney University both developers, as developer, um, I, I really had a couple of steps back so I could go back into the workforce in, in a new country. Um, but it didn't took long for me to go back into leadership roles at Census, then my job and where I am today at A Cloud Group. 
this time, especially with this pandemic, cloud is, I think, one of the best parts of the industry to be. But hold on to that, that we're going to talk a little bit more with Alex. Yeah, exactly, Simone. So I, I always like to start at the uh, very basics. So could you give us a brief intro into what the cloud is and what role it plays in today's technology world? And also in case people don't know, what is a Cloud Guru's mission in relation to all this? Look, um, the term cloud or cloud computing is everywhere these days. So I hope this is not news to anyone listening to, to the podcast. But in the simplest terms, cloud computing means storing and assessing data and programs over the internet instead of your computer. And um, these days, it's also used as a metaphor for, for the internet. The role that it plays in the industry these days is huge. Um, I mean, it's hard to hear about, you know, private data centers these days. So everyone is, is shifting to the cloud. And this is pretty much the journey that a lot of the organizations or, you know, leading organizations are, are going through now or have already built their platforms on um, in the cloud. And a Cloud's Guru mission is about teaching the world to cloud. So we are an online training education company and our focus is the cloud. And our vision for the future is really to enable anyone, anywhere to become a cloud guru and achieve a better and brighter future. Obviously, technical skills are good and necessary in our tech careers. But two points here, certifications, like the cloud provider ones, and also what would you say about soft skills or non-technical skills that you believe are important to, to thrive in today's highly competitive world and basically how to balance between the two? Yeah, I think certifications are getting uh, quite popular these days. Um, you know, it, you hear a lot about organizations looking for people with specific skills and, and certifications. I can talk a bit about the most popular certifications or the top paying certifications because I think that might be quite of interest to the listeners here. At A Cloud Guru, the most popular certifications are the AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate, AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner and the AWS Certified Developer Associate. If you look at the top paying certifications, um, the top two are actually cloud certifications. Interestingly enough, Google Certified Professional Cloud Architect is the top one, followed by AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate. And uh, the one that I mentioned about AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner is number eight. So you can see that the cloud certifications are taking a bit of a lead in, in terms of the top paying certifications. But obviously, money is not everything. So for example, AWS is the clear market leader among, amongst the public cloud providers with about 80% of enterprises running apps or experimenting with them on, on Amazon's cloud. Microsoft is the second with 67% market penetration. Google is, is third with 41%. So having a greater market share doesn't necessarily mean higher pay, but you know there are definitely more opportunities out there if you want to change or progress uh, in your career with AWS, for example. And obviously, you know your company cloud roadmap can influence your choice. Definitely becoming an important uh, skill that organizations are looking for. We did run a a big program a couple of months ago where if you get a certification at a cloud guru, you can refer a friend. And I actually got certified. Just so you know, everyone that joins a cloud guru, doesn't matter in which department you are, whether you're technical or not, you need to get a cloud certification. And um, I referred a friend, which I think you know, Simone Denise. Um, Denise is a physiotherapist and she's thinking about changing careers and she's using Cloud Guru to do that. So I'm, I'm super excited that I could help her with, with that transition. I come across and I meet so many people that are like massive fans of A Cloud Guru. And funny enough, 
I mean, we do have a lot of business with AWS. Um, and just so you know, AWS trained their people with our cloud, um, with our platform. So the architect that from AWS that is that helps with our account, he's one of our biggest fans. Like he's literally built their career based on the learnings from a cloud guru. So he's one of those guys that are so happy to work with us as a client because it means a lot. Um, we have definitely helped a lot of people have better better opportunities with, with our training. Including myself. And me. Awesome. To your question about soft skills for technical contribution, contributors, communication is extremely important. You know, this is all about uh, the individual's ability to explain complex, complex problems in a way that non-technical people can understand. And as part of that, knowing your audience so you can just adjust the tone and, and the way that you communicate is, is important. Collaboration in agile uh, delivery, it's all about the team, not the individuals. And we often say that we prefer to have a team of average people that work extremely well together than a team of stars that can't, can't get along or can't get anything done as a team. That is important. You know, having empathy in our industry, like building technology is all about solving problems, but we cannot solve problems unless we understand the user's pain. So empathy becomes vital in understanding and relating to the problems that you're trying to solve. Lastly, I would say that the other two important skills here would be building relationships and having a good reputation. Those things, they go hand in hand. You can, you can have a good networking, but if you don't have a good reputation, that's not going to help you moving forward in your career. But in the same way, you could have an extremely good reputation, but if you don't build um, good working relationships, it, it becomes hard to move forward as well. So building relationships and, and having a good reputation, a good personal brand does, does go a long way. Finally, how do I balance the two? I would say that, you know, having a career development plan is definitely helpful so that you can set a good balance between the soft and the technical skills. And the priorities will also depend on what on your ultimate goals are. So having the plan and the goals laid out can help you, you know, prioritize and, and figure out what is it that you need to do first. So it's always good to have a mix of, you know, um, soft skills, technical skills, and, and also some personal uh, goals as well, because it's important to perhaps have something there that can actually make you as a better person. Wow, so much in there. I think resonates most with me is when you mention about, you know, the to be an average person in the team that collaborates well together, which normally I refer to like the analogy to a Formula One pit stop, right? So you have everyone in there that uh, they know exactly what each one has to do. They do really well um, and they are not special in any shape or form. So yeah, if you, I mean, when, when the collaboration is not properly balanced within the team, someone's going to carry the load. And those things, they don't create sustainable paces for teams. So everyone needs to, to come up to the table. You know, we, we say that we like to give people autonomy, but, you know, without the accountability, it's like going on holidays, right? So we, we need to have those two things um, going hand in hand as well. And hold each other accountable is part of making sure that everyone's collaborating and contributing. Yeah, very important points about team building and working relationships. And I would like to come back to this. But actually, I also have a follow-up question about certifications. I would like to know what a certification provides in addition to just having these skills. So why is it important for people to get certified? Yeah, look, I do, I do think people have different views um, on this point. Like, as cloud continues to become the norm for organizations, 
new opportunities to specialize in the cloud space are opening up, right? And having a cloud uh, certification does help you validate your knowledge. And for some people, it does provide like a structured path for learning. And as I said before, like the cloud transformation journey that many organizations are going through requires specialized skills. So it's natural that companies are now looking for those industry credentials to help them with the hiring process or the hiring decisions. The certification could be a determining factor or deal breaker in, in some job interviews. However, because someone has a certification doesn't mean that they are experts in, in their field. So the, the practical, the hands-on experience goes a long way here. So if you don't mind discussing, given the new remote way of working we started this year, did you notice any changes in the number of users or number of certifications acquired compared to previous years? Or are we changing our ways of learning too, not just working? And how much different do you think this space is going to be from now on? Cool. I mean, obviously, I'm talking about globally here because we operate um, across the globe. Obviously, the, the different markets, like in Australia, the situation um, is definitely different from the US, for example. But overall, we are seeing growth. Like financially, the company is doing well. We, we are an online education company in the cloud computing uh, space. So we are right at the intersection of these two things, which have been super important in, in these pandemic times. From an individual uh, growth perspective, that that is steadily growing for, for us. But the majority of the growth in our company has been from what we call the B2B space, like from companies that buy licenses for their employees. So what we have seen is that the pandemic has definitely pushed organizations to accelerate their, their cloud journey. So from, from the business perspective, this has been mostly where the change is, you know, the acceleration of the cloud programs and the investment in their workforce. So if you are thinking about migrating to the cloud, the first thing that you normally look is your people um, or those people that make your cloud adoption succeed. Just to give you some stats, like the lack of cloud talent will affect about 86% of projects in 2020. This is from LogicWorks um, source. The expected cost to hire a mid-career cloud engineer is about 30K, and cloud training can have an ROI of two to six times for an organization. So that's why a lot of organizations are turning to their employees and upskilling the workforce more than, than going out there to the market, but they're still creating those opportunities for people. From the individual's perspective, the importance, importance of certifications driven by the organizations is growing, as I said, and it's creating more opportunities for them. So there is a lot of people that have been affected by COVID that are also seeing opportunities to upskill with cloud training and, and to progress in their careers and become better professionals. And we've seen a lot of that coming through to us. And, and this is the essence of our cloud group mission, like teaching the world to cloud. In terms of Different from now on, I would say that learn by doing is definitely an element that we have changed in our approach, you know, providing our users with access to hands-on labs and cloud playgrounds to consolidate their learning experience without incurring the, the, the costs of running labs in, in the different cloud providers. What else? For many organizations, the cloud transformation is just starting. So they really need to create a culture of cloud innovation as they mature their cloud journey. So I think this is another aspect that is changing, creating more opportunities for companies and individuals. Many companies are investing on multi-cloud to reduce risk and, and drive potential cost savings. So, you know, I mean, obviously, we work with the three major cloud providers and having that offering is, is a big differentiator for us as well. Perhaps finally, a lot of organizations, based on what we've seen, are looking for personalized learning at scale. So they really want to 
learning experience for the stage of their cloud journey or the cloud maturity. So you can see a lot of companies appreciating the way that we have structured our learning paths and even now looking at creating some custom learning paths, um, features for companies that want to, you know, set their own learning path for their, for their employees. These are the things that um, we are seeing that, that is becoming a bit, a bit of a differentiator and, and that the market is looking for now. Good point. I wish we had these ways of learning when we were at school. <laughs> yeah, no, um, you know, a lot of the old or traditional um, learning is, is all based on books and theory. So um, I also wish we, we had the opportunity to, to incorporate the, the hands-on learning to complement the, the learning experience. You had a point about how cloud transformation also requires cultural change in an organization. So what do you think the best ways are to create that culture of innovation? Um, I think first is to recognize that if you are migrating to the cloud and if this is an important transformation that the organization is going through, you need to create awareness and you need to embrace it. You know, upskilling people and making sure that cloud is an integral part of what the company does and, and learning development for their employees is, is what it will, in my opinion, start to shift the culture and making sure that they are um, supporting their people to, to embrace the mission and, and, and their goals. Yeah, well, in my, from my experience, you could have the best technology and even some of the best professionals, but if the culture in the company is not following certain standards, I don't want to, to define or to be, to be rigid here because the culture is not good for whatever reason. We can be talking about you know, many, many different points why the culture is not that great. But to your point, you know, just look, if it's working, keep it. If it's not working so well as you imagine, change. Just use what we know already for other disciplines like DevOps, Agile, right? Especially talk, talking about DevOps. Fail, but fail fast. Then you can fix it, learn from your mistake, from your failure, and move on to achieve your what you call success much quicker. And what I'm talking about, I think it applies to both personal and co corporations so yeah good point agree in your previous roles you have been the head of delivery managed relationships with executive leaders and business partners help define the strategy roadmap key initiatives and so on so my question is what do you think the traits of a good leader are what makes a good leader are you born with those skills or can you somehow learn them? Cool. Um, you, you find that people have varying experiences and perspectives on, on the traits of a good leader and not all situations require the same type of leadership style. In my mind, great leaders, they adapt to the surrounding environments. So they are in this sort of perpetual state of preparation and embracing change that their businesses will face. So that's definitely an important point. I also believe that, you know, the best leaders are passionate about developing the emerging leaders around them, empowering their people. They constantly work to improve the emotional intelligence and, and know that a strong team culture is the foundation to accomplish you know, whatever mission they, they've got for the team or, or for the company. We talked about communication being a good skill for an individual contributor. I would say that for the leader, that is also very important. You know, until you clearly communicate your vision to your team and you set direction, it will be very difficult for, for you to get the results that you want. So words have the power to motivate people and make them do the unthinkable if you use them effectively and you can also achieve great results. 
at the end of the day, when it really comes down to it, the most important factor for me is whether or not, you know, the leader gets the job done. The second part of your question was about whether people can learn or not those skills. I think people can learn anything that they set their mind to it. Having a good role model is important, you know, especially if this is, if you are trying to learn skills that, that you, you don't have or that you strongly need to develop. So I've, I've learned the most when I worked with, with some exceptional leaders. And, you know, you hear a lot of people saying that they don't leave organizations, they leave leaders. And this is true, like having horrible leaders is probably the reason why a lot of people leave organizations. So having a good, a good mentor, a good role model is, is an essential part of, uh, in supporting this, learning those, those leadership skills for sure. Yeah, agreed. Especially about people leaving because of not having good leaders. Yeah, can be very damaging, I think from a mental health point of view also? Oh, I've been, I've been at organizations where it took years for us to, to drive a cultural transformation and it took a couple of months for, for a bad leader to, to screw it up you know, and, and kill it. So some of the recent companies that I've worked have just been through, through that. And it's sad if you if you were a key part in, in building that culture and, and, and creating the, the new environment for, for those individuals and seeing that disappear so quickly. Yeah, that uh, must have been some, something very annoying, of course, but uh, yeah, to build things takes time. To destroy is like a, a blink of an eye. Mm. You mentioned, you know, about uh, a good leader to help people around and several other things. But I have one question that aspect. So how does one leader identify their successor and, you know, someone that they could train to be their future successor or something? So how does it work for you to identify, to say, yes, this professional is worth it, my time or my effort to train to become a new me sort of thing? Yeah, look. You definitely look at high performers in your team, people that are performing above and beyond their responsibilities and, and people that are actually seeking for extra challenge or extra opportunities to, to grow. You might find some of those people, but it's, it has to be a mutual agreement here. You, you know, someone needs to be interested in, in becoming part of your succession plan if you want, um, to look from that perspective. So I have helped through career development. I have identified people that wanted to do what I was doing at the time. And we had a mutual agreement for them to become part of my succession plan. And, and then from that point onwards, the building of their career development plan was about understanding the skills that were required for my role that they didn't have or that they needed to improve and, and building a plan around that. So normally you look for those individuals that are really having an outstanding performance or people that have, you know, proactively seek the, the, the challenge and, and the opportunity to, to move to the role that you, you, you're talking about. The next point, Alex, um, I'd like to touch is about networking. How important you think it is and how do you network? You mentioned previously that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are as a professional if nobody knows about it, right? Yeah. So you need to, to talk to other people, be exposed. So how you do that? And also, as we are here, what kind of impact does social media have for your own branding in the professional world? Cool. Um, I... As as you as you highlighted, and as I mentioned before, networking is is extremely important. Someone told me about those two skills: networking or building relationships, if you want, and and reputation. And and that is something that I've I've always been mindful of. 
Uh, in terms of what I do, um, I do have a close group of technology leaders that I've worked together and we, we, get, we catch up on a regular basis. A lot of those catch-ups are mostly social, but we do talk about opportunities and what's going on in the market and so forth. So over time, you do tend to build a close group of people that start to, to form your, your some part of your network. Um, the other thing that I do as well, I, there are some meetups that, that I go to. The CTO is school in Melbourne is, is one of those. You know, like-minded people, you get to share your experiences and you get to learn from, from them as well. And as you do that, you, you meet other people and you, and you build relationships. I mean, there's always the old-fashioned coffee with people. You know, I understand that it's hard these days. So I've been using LinkedIn a bit more than, than I used to because we can't meet people at the moment. But when I, when I left my job, that was something that I did quite a bit was just reaching out to my network and, you know, catching up face to face with people, even reestablishing some of those connections that I had from, from old jobs. So that is super important. That does open up doors and, and create opportunities for you. When it comes to social media, it can definitely be a dangerous thing. I, I'm mostly on Instagram these days. Facebook for me is only for birthdays and, and that's it. So you, you do need to be mindful about what you post um, on social media. It is okay for people to have opinions and different perspectives on religion, politics, and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking more about the more serious topics here, like you know racism, sexism, and et cetera. So we should know what's wrong and what's not and you definitely need to think about before you post things and and be true to your values and life so and i understand that some people will have different perspectives on this i've got my own principles and my own values and i'm very mindful about what i shared and what i post um if you look at my instagram it's going to be mostly motorcycle brazilian jiu-jitsu and that's it so <laughs> and family and that's it i'm not I tend to not share too much so you also touched upon mentorship. Do you think it's important to have a mentor and what should one consider when looking for one? I do. I do think it's important. I do have a mentor. I was lucky enough to, to have some really good managers and leaders and, and I do consider some of, some of them my mentors and they have been super important in a lot of the professional decisions that I've, that I've made. And I do know that, you know, when individuals are trying to seek for help and support, they turn on a variety of things. And obviously coaching, mentoring are, are often the key ones. We tend to interchangeably use those two words, um, coaching and, and mentoring. In my mind, mentoring is is providing that vision, uh, that wisdom and guidance based on the experience that you have. But, you know, those mentoring relationships, um, you know, may include an element of coaching. There's no perfect model for mentors and great advice here. Um, so normally mentorships are defined or built within the organization that you work for, but they don't necessarily have to be someone from uh, the organization. If I was going to talk about things that people should consider when they, they're after uh, a mentoring relationship with someone is definitely know your goals, perhaps both short-term and long-term. You know, what do you want to accomplish professionally in the next three months, in the next two, five years? You got to have a, a good picture of that so that you can get the most out of the relationship. Perhaps the other important element here to consider is like, who are the people that you look up to? Whose job would you like to have in the next five years? You know, is that person inside your organization or your workplace? You know, who is the immediate role model where you work? You know, be, be mindful about your existing network and, and do a bit of a research as well. You definitely want to find someone 
they share similar values and principles to you, someone perhaps that you you trust and you're comfortable with. Otherwise, you you will find difficult to take on their adv- advice and definitely don't reach out to strangers. Um, that's not how you find them. You definitely need to build a relationship with the person, have, as I said, been comfortable with them and be aligned with, with their thinking before you, you want to go down the path of, of a mentorship. Yeah, so don't just ask directly, understand and get to know the person first. Yeah, for sure. Like It's hard for a mentor to help someone where you, you don't have a connection or you don't know much about the person. You know, you don't know what you can say and you can't say. Building that relationship is before the mentoring relationship is important. Makes sense. You have a proven track record of building successful teams. My question, when you want to build a team, where do you start? What are the things that you should think about it and start doing to achieve that high performing team? Yeah, yeah, that is a really good question. There are certain elements in my mind that are important here. You know, first of all, you, you, you need to look for a strong leadership, you know, someone that helps the team become more effective at making decisions, someone that fosters effective collaboration within the team, someone that sets clear direction and communicates with the team, and, and perhaps most importantly, someone that grow their people. The second element here would be alignment and commitment to a common purpose. Your people need to understand why they're doing what they're doing. So reiterating that shared goal, shared vision as often as possible is very important. And when you've got that shared vision plus the strong leadership, it is what creates self-organizing teams. So that is key. Next, you want to you wanna make sure that you have the right talent and the right skills to solve the problem. In Agile Delivery, we talk a lot about cross-functional teams. So this is key. Like you, if you need a team that's going to be building user interfaces, normally having a product designer would be of a huge help. So having those right talents and the right skills with the, within the team, it's, it's, it's good. Next, I would say that that without a high level of trust within the team, it's going to be very difficult for them to be successful. As a leader, you definitely need to create a space for people to share their opinions and fail, um, or what we call psychological safety, falling through your commitments and things like that to help creating trust. And the trust is two ways between the leader, but also between the people within the team as well. If I maybe could add one more thing, I would say that continuous improvement mindset is is important. You don't form high-performing teams overnight. So it takes time for the team to actually, as they say, form norm storm. Every time you change someone within the team, you've got to go through this process. So being able to reflect on how, as a team, they are operating and identifying things that they need to improve from the way they work, the processes that they follow, etc., is is important. Yeah, really good points about the trust and mindset. And I particularly like the idea of this uh, of reiterating and really reinforcing that shared vision because when you're very busy in the middle of work, we tend to forget why we started and where we are heading. So I think that's very important. Yeah, look, I'm, I think in the past, we, we used to tell engineering teams what to do. So you would often see product managers figuring out what needs to be built to solve a problem and leaving to the engineering teams just the how. And what I've seen is that those teams where you give them a problem to solve, for them to figure out what to do to solve the problem and really connect to the purpose of the problem that they're trying to solve, having that shared goal, it does 
make people more connected with the work it makes people more engaged and more engaged more connected people means more productive people so there is definitely an accession element um here yeah i think into what we just said everyone talks about thinking outside the box etc but you need to make that possible right so i think this change that you mentioned about it giving the opportunity for them to think from you know basically end to end that enriches the process enriches their learning and then they can actually think outside the box yeah you i mean you know we are all looking for bright people when we are hiring when we are forming teams and you know when you hire bright smart people they these people they want challenge they want problems to solve if you just tell them what to do it's not enough these days i'm also very curious to ask you about failure so did you ever encounter failure and how do you deal with it on a professional and personal level who has never made mistakes or failed um i think this is just part of life right I guess for me the way that I think about it either on a personal or professional level it's not very different don't make excuses you know on it you know if you've made a mistake or if you failed take the responsibility failure for me or maybe the way that I look at failure is always a learning opportunity So if you're not learning when you make a mistake you're missing an opportunity to get better and grow so definitely we need to look and you know I hope that organizations really creating that psychological safety where it's safe to fail and why not celebrate failure in the same way that we celebrate wins you know as i said as long as you're learning from it you know we should we should be celebrating because we're going to be better with that new knowledge than we were before and like to be honest most of the time doing something with the risk of failure is better than doing nothing so you know if you want to make a change if you want to have different outcomes you got to try different things and just accept that things may go wrong and if they do go wrong you're going to you know find the the learning opportunities in them would you agree that uh, some people call this like a startup mindset right that uh, you are small you can have chances more or more chances to fail compared to a big organization do you still believe that that's true like of uh, the big organizations tend not to have this mindset yeah look um i think a lot of it is to do how you break down the work and how you structure you know projects and initiatives like we we talk a lot about this at work we talk about the importance of having smaller batches of work so you know we've been experimenting recently with you know fixed time with variable scope so you know really trying to set a fixed time frame for people to deliver a project so that they can slice the work in better ways and we are seeing some incredible outcomes from that the the biggest one is that having a fixed time is forcing people to slice the work and when you slice the work you need to make sure that there is a something of value at the end of it so let's say if you are slicing the work in a sprint or in a two weeks or let's say two sprints or four weeks uh, period you want to make sure that there is a business value or a customer value as part of this slice of the work and you want that slice to be as small as possible because you get feedback quicker from your customers but also if something goes wrong and if you fail and if you're not meeting the success criteria of your of your project or or your goals you can iterate and you can change quickly so for me like the the thing about failing fast is all about slicing the work in smaller batches and and have frequent feedback from your customers so basically an agile approach yeah you you can definitely say that this is mostly common in in agile the then then in other traditional methodologies for sure so 
we talked about failure now what does success look like for you uh for me um I mean, this definition has definitely changed over time. These days, for me, it's all about feeling fulfilled, happy, safe, healthy, loved. Um, family is a big thing for me, so that is definitely part of how I celebrate success and and something that um, I want to make sure it's part of uh, that criteria. In other words, like if it's from a, I guess, professional perspective, for me, success is all about achieving whatever goals you have set to yourself. Um, and I think that probably works well in, the, in my personal life too. You know, I think it's, it's more often these days you're talking about goals on a professional level than on a personal level, but you do, you do set sometimes informal goals at the personal level. And when you reach those goals, you do get that feeling of achievement and, and success. So, you know, But these days with the pandemic and everything else, being safe and healthy is definitely success for me. Because you mentioned family. How do you balance personal life and career? Yeah, this is a good question. Like these challenging times with COVID have definitely taught me many lessons. You know, it's too easy to get trapped, you know, for 14 hours in front of a computer when you're working from home. So I have definitely had to do or put a lot of effort in defining a routine for me. You know, the time that I start the day and the time that I finish, you know, making sure that I've got those clear boundaries so I can have a better balance between the two. You know, working from home, those lines between personal life and professional life, they get blurred quite easily. I find that, you know, having a routine, first of all, but also like having a hobby, something outside of work that you love doing it, that you, I guess, can manage to do during these times is good. Like I love motorcycling, but, you know, it's hard when you've got only 5Ks from where you are to to go out on a ride. It's not very exciting to just go to the supermarket and back. And I'm also... Uh, very passionate about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I coach in, in one of the gyms in the city that have been closed since March. And not being able to train with my friends and partners is, is tough. So I miss that part of my routine and, and personal life. So it's just really finding ways that you can, that you can enjoy. Like I, I've been doing a lot more walks and runs these days with my with my family than I used to. And I I think that has helped me, you know, have a better personal and career balance. Yeah, I suppose this lockdown and this pandemic have made us, or most of us anyway, to rethink and reinvent ourselves because be, you know, full 24 by 7 um, is not an easy task. After all, we are social beings, right? Yeah, and it does force you to learn new skills and, I guess, enjoy different things that perhaps you didn't value as much before the lockdown or the pandemic. I've been appreciating a lot more the surroundings of our suburb and and the parks and and the walks, whereas before it was just too easy to just jump on a car and and go to the supermarket. Now we make sure that we, we walk and we exercise a bit more. Nice. But going back to the career, what are the most things you are passionate about in tech? And what gets you out of bed in the morning? What makes you tick? Yeah, so like for me, um, working with smart people is the most passionate thing about technology, to be honest. You know, there's so many bright people uh, and it's great to see you know, those creative minds in action. So for me, um, I'm super excited about that. As a leader, helping people succeed is also maybe probably the biggest reward as a leader. You know, I've helped a lot of people grow, even to the point that they left the organization to pursue better opportunities. And, And for me, that was one of the biggest rewards that I had as a leader. In terms of what gets me out of, bed 
I would say that an intrinsic motivation that I have is to help people succeed. Since a young age, I've been in, back in Brazil, I was involved with volunteering work and working in the community. It was very common to have young adults group as part of the Catholic church that we used to go. And, and that was a, a big part of my, of my time in Brazil as a teenager. And that, that feeling of helping others and helping people sort of permeates throughout my career and probably one of the most exciting things as a leader. So I have helped develop career development frameworks for many organizations, including a cloud guru, and just seeing people do better and grow and succeed is, is super exciting. And that's one thing that really gets me out of bed every single day. Yeah, and given that technology is evolving all the time, do you have tips on how to keep up with all these advancements? How do you do it? Yeah, like I think uh, that would be different for everyone. Um, having a curiosity, curious mind is is important. Like I do follow a couple of key blogs, like Martin Fowler is 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 one of my favorites. Um, I do have a um, HBR. Uh, subscription uh, which i which i love there's a lot of leadership and strategy articles there that i always get a lot of value from um i like attending conferences like that gives me exposure to things that are happening out there and and open my mind to things that i could potentially bring into the organization that i work for you know we we talked about a bit about meetups i feel like you know, in, in organizations, we do a lot of the community of practices or the guilds. I think this is something that um, I find super helpful to get across. I love attending the engineering guilds that we've got. Like I learned so much from our own engineers and, and my peer group. I find exciting to, to join those guilds and or the communities of practices and in line with, with our own people as well by no means an expert in everything. And, you know, I'm always amazed with the skills and what the people in our company can do. So I always tend to learn from them. And if you would have to think about one book, or could be more than one, but at least one book that you'd recommend for people, could be something that have changed your life or not, but uh, that you think it's important, what that would be? So I have read uh, David Goggins' book recently. Uh, it's called Can't Hurt Me. Um, it's all about mastering your mind, as he calls, like defeating your inner bitch. You know, the thing that really, you know, stops you, stops you from achieving greater goals and, and overcome your own fears and things like that. So I, I found that book extremely um, interesting. David Goggins has a very, or had a very interesting upbringing in life. And it is like amazing to see how that man is literally unbreakable and how he's overcome uh, the challenge in his life. So that is obviously uh, non-technical. If I could pick another book, there is one book that I read at least once a year and every time I read I learn something different because it makes me reflect based on the new knowledge that I have and how I've grown and and matured as a as a professional seven habits of highly effective people from Stephen Covey is is definitely one in my bookshelf that I've gone through a couple of times and Every time I do it, I learn something different or I pay attention to another detail. So I couldn't recommend that more. Yeah, I love this book. And I totally agree with you because each time you read, it doesn't matter how long apart, you were a different person. Mm -hmm. You had been through different experiences. So you are a new version of yourself. So when you go and read, you're going to pay attention to something else as well. I know I read this book, but I don't remember saying this. How come? And good to know this other one. Yeah, I'll add that into my list, David Goggins. Yeah. Uh, So is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners today? 
it was an awesome pleasure talking to you two today. Maybe if I could just say one last thing, if you haven't heard about a Cloud Guru, um, go in and check us out. We've been doing some great things since we acquired the Next Academy and there's a lot, of, a lot of good stuff coming up soon. So definitely an awesome learning platform if you want to you know, improve your skills in the cloud and the adjacent technologies. So thank you. Thank you for today. It was a pleasure talking to you. Just another thing. Um, if people would like to connect with you, how can they find you and where? I think LinkedIn would be the best, the best channel to, to connect. So if you search for Alex Barreto, you will definitely find me there. Great. We're going to put the, the link in the show notes. Well, Alex, it was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your thoughts and knowledge with us today. Awesome. Thank you. It was my pleasure. In today's podcast, we talked about cloud certifications and heard that getting certified opens up new opportunities, helps you validate your knowledge and provides a path for learning. The top paying certifications are Google Certified Solutions Architect and AWS Certified Solutions Architect. If you want to advance your career, it's important to work on your relationships, but don't forget about your reputation either. In terms of mentorship, know your goals, know what you want to achieve in the short and long run. Choose a mentor that you know and trust and look around, because that mentor might be found in your own network. In Alex's definition, good leaders are the ones who adapt to their surroundings and embrace change that's coming their way. They are passionate about empowering their people and they are emotionally intelligent. And the last thing, the recipe for highly efficient teams is the following. Strong leadership, alignment and commitment to common purpose, the right talent, creating psychological safety, and continuous improvement mindset for setting it all up. When it comes to people and collaboration, keep it in mind. It might be better to have a team of average people than a team of rock stars who are unable to work together. Thanks for listening. We hope you will have a nice holiday and we will be back in the new year.